Hey, welcome back to the shop. Today I thought it would be fun to do a deep dive into composite video signals and component video signals. These are the two main type of um, analog video signals you'll get in sort of consumer and prosumer uh, video equipment. As I mentioned in the video yesterday, composite video, which is what I've got up on the scope uh, right now, uh, is this one wire, typically a yellow RCA connector that you'll see on the back of VCRs, video cameras, uh, back of TVs, that's how you hook up the video signal um, from one device to another. Uh, component, which is what I'm using in my video synth, uh, has three signals. I talked a little bit about that yesterday, but I'll go into a deep dive of both of them. Um, neither of these signals include the audio, it's just pure video. So if you're hooking up the back of a TV, you're probably used to hooking in the yellow for video and white and red for the two stereo channels of audio. Today we're only talking about video. And we're gonna start off by looking at composite video. Okay, what I've got set up here is I've got an NTSC video camera with the video out going directly into channel one of my oscilloscope. You can ignore the other channels, I'm not using them right now. And what we're seeing on the screen now, if you're not familiar with an oscilloscope, is time goes along this way, voltage along this way. And what we're looking at here is a composite NTSC video signal. Each one of these chunks repeats 60 times a second and they represent one field of information and two fields make a frame. So the way uh, uh, video signals work is they scan horizontally, left to right and top to bottom across the screen and use voltage to encode the brightness of how bright the picture is at any point in time. And so this represents one half the frame, this is the other half of the frame. The way uh, NTSC and PAL work is they're interlaced, which means it does the odd lines in one frame, one field, and even lines in the next field. But that's neither here nor there. So this signal here represents the entire uh, frame, and we can zoom in and see individual lines. So this is one scan line. You'll notice there's a little bit of a blank segment at the beginning. Then there's a little boopy thing here, which we'll go into in a moment. And then the brightness signal that happens over there. Now let's do some measurement on the screen. Uh, we, oop, we'll do a cursor, manual. And let's see how long it takes for a line to happen. So we'll start at the start of the line, which is that little negative pulse there. And we'll measure the time to the next one. So this happens about uh, 17,000 times a second, 17 kilohertz uh, per line. So what's happening in this line signal is sort of three bits of information. There's the brightness of the screen or the brightness of the image, which is generally thought of as the luminance or called the luminance. There is this little negative going pulse here. This is the horizontal sync pulse. It tells the timing information to the receiving, let's say you plugged into a TV, it tells the TV when to start the next new line. And then there's this little thing here called a color burst, because this is just one wire, but it encodes uh, not only black and white video, but also color video. And the way that it does that is if you zoom in to the luminance, this sort of curve going up and down here, you'll see that it wibbles and wobbles up and down at a carrier frequency, which is determined by this carrier frequency. So what happens is the TV waits for the sync pulse. It sees this, what's called a color burst. It locks its oscillator, which is set at the same frequency to the same phase as this color burst signal. Then it demodulates this. There are two frequency modulated signals within this carrier band that include information about color. So if you have color represented by three color types, red, green, and blues, then you need to encode three bits of information. And so the luminance is basically the sum of R, G, and B. It's the total brightness of the screen. And so the two other bits of information are encoded, uh, frequency modulated into uh, this signal here that you can decode using the color burst. So as you can tell, that's already getting into some pretty significant RF engineering if you want to extract color information out of a composite video signal. There are chips that'll do it for you. You can design circuits yourself, but it becomes a bunch of work that you have to do. The other bit of timing that happens is at the start of each frame, let's see if we can get one of these zoomed in. There is a special sort of vertical sync pulse. So you can see here, here are the usual little sync pulses representing uh, the horizontal sync. Then it switches to sort of 
the opposite polarity and that tells the TV or the receiver that we're now starting a new field. So that's what you call your uh, vertical sync pulse. These are your horizontal sync pulses. That's the basic anatomy of a composite video signal. And so it's got everything you need. So you think, why would you want to use three cables when you can use just one cable? And the reason is resolution. Because you are doing this thing with the color burst, you're limited to what can be encoded at that carrier frequency, like by Nyquist theorem. And so you're limited to the total resolution that you can display in an NTSC or PAL signal. With component video, which is running over the three wires, we don't have to deal uh, with any of this RF encoding and you can go up to 1080p. In fact, you could probably even go higher. The, you're not really bandwidth limited when you don't have this RF modulation happening. So let's have a look at a, a, a component signal. Okay, what I've done here is I've hooked up my computer's video out, which supports components into the oscilloscope. We have the three channels here. Component runs over three wires, typically a green, red, and blue wire. The green wire signal is the here in yellow because we're gonna be confusing with our colors. The blue uh, is in blue and the red is in magenta. If we just look here at this yellow signal, which is coming through the, the green wire, it looks kind of like our composite video channel. In fact, it looks really a lot like it. If we sort of look at it at just sort of a macro level, there is an entire frame. Now in the case of component, I'm sending out non-interlaced video. This is 1080p, so progressive. That's an entire frame there. There's none of that field nonsense. You can see there's like that horizontal, uh, sorry, that vertical pulse happening there telling you that the start of each frame, and here are all of your lines. Let's zoom in and look at an individual line. You'll remember you had that little sync pulse in the uh, composite video signal. Then there was a color burst and then there was the signal itself. Here we don't have the color burst because we don't need to encode or RF modulate the color information just in one wire. This one wire, the green wire, contains just the luminance information. The red wire and the blue wire contain the red information minus luminance and the blue information minus luminance. And again, just by doing some linear algebra, you can get back that individual red, green, and blue from those three signals, three equations, three unknowns. Um, the reason why we have luminance over the one wire rather than just green is if you were to plug a component signal in to a component in on a television, it looks identical, it's luminance, it would just be a normal black and white image. So that's kind of cool. You can take a component video signal, take the, the, the green wire, stick it into a composite input, and you'll just get black and white, and that'll look fine. If you look at these two other channels, you'll see that they don't have the sync pulse. They're simply just that color information. And this means you can encode much higher resolution and you can have basically infinite bit depth of uh, the color. HDMI video sticking out uh, you know, high quality uh, video out of your computer, you can do 1080p. If you've you know, got great gear, you can do 10 bits of information per channel you can easily get 10 bits of um, signal resolution over component video. So you can get HDMI quality video through analog cables like this, which is great because it's amenable to messing around with analog circuitry. With this bit of knowledge added to our arsenal, we can add another effect to this synth. What we've added here is an op amp. This is an LT1260. This is a three-in-one op amp that's designed for video signals. That's why you've got the three-in-one. You can do uh, work really well with um, component video signals. These two big yellow components here are just decoupling capacitors, and I've got a bunch of 1K resistors configuring the three op amps in here as inverting uh, voltage followers. So if you put one volt in, you'll get minus one volt out. If you put in half a volt, you'll get half a volt minus out. And so what we've done is we've taken the red channel and the blue channel, or the red wire and the blue wire, put them in here, and we have the opposite voltage coming out the other side. And we've attached a pot potentiometer here, which allows us to sweep between the positive or the negative signal on the blue cable. And so we can get uh, some color changes. And so here you can do some color correcting uh, in analog, very high resolution, very high bit depth with some basic components. Okay, I have pre-drawn today's circuit diagrams. Um, hopefully they're a little neater. Uh, what we have here is two circuit diagrams involving op amps. This is the most basic circuit diagram with an op amp. Um, an op amp has an inverting, which is the minus, and a non-inverting input, and an output. It also has uh, pins for power. With this circuit, whatever voltage X you put in here 
will just be X that comes out there. Why would such a circuit exist? It's really useful for not worrying about impedance and current draw because on an ideal op amp at least, uh, inputs take uh, no current, they draw no current, they just sense the voltage there. And uh, so your circuit over here won't impact what's happening on the circuit over there. The circuit we're using in uh, the demonstration I just showed you, here is an op amp in what's called the inverting amplifier configuration. Your X comes in here, goes through a voltage divider where the middle of the voltage divider is the inverting input, the non-inverting input is going to ground and the output here is just going to be minus X. Um, remember what an op amp does is it takes a difference between these two signals and tries to put the, that on the output. And in a feedback, a negative feedback configuration like this, um, it's going to try and get the voltages on both of here to be equal. So if this one's referenced at ground, when you have a positive signal coming in here, it's going to try and generate a negative signal to negate out the voltage coming in there. And it's an amplifier uh, depending on the value of these two resistances here. This feedback resistor RF, and this is R1. Um, the output here is equal to X times RF over R1 negative. What I've done in the video is I included this where the X signal coming in here was, I believe, the blue channel. So that's represented in component as PB. That's what's coming in here. Then rather than taking just the inverting output there, I've put another potentiometer here acting as a voltage divider across there, and the output comes out of here. So uh, this obviously impacts uh, the gain here, so you have to be careful as to what values you use. When this potentiometer is all the way down here, it's just getting the non-inverted um, signal. When the potentiometer is all the way here, it's getting the inverted signal. Um, I just have two 1K 1K ohm resistors here and here, so it just has a gain of negative one, so this is just the opposite of that. And that allows us to do the color changing. All right, I'll be back with a new video soon.